الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد as to what proceeds after praising Allah the Most High separated from his creation in a manner which befits his majesty with love and veneration exclusively for him and by sending and requesting salatu salam upon the final messenger Muhammad ibn Abdullah al-Qurashi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Once again we meet for our weekly meeting to conduct the study of the book Al-Usul Al-Thalathat famously known as the three fundamentals or the three foundations illustri- illustrated by the Sheikh Al-Islam of his time Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab At-Tamimi Rahimahullah Ta'ala And we agreed that before we start to study this book there are certain etiquettes or adab which a student of knowledge a talib al-ilm must abide by and we agreed that these etiquettes or manners will be discussed in the in a preface known as the madkhal and i think we've had almost 13 to 14 meetings maybe this is the 15th meeting if i'm not mistaken with regards to this preface which will be beneficial nafi if allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills and blesses it in all the other subjects that you may study and with all the other teachers that you may obtain knowledge from and very soon we shall be coming to an end of this preface and starting the book but i believe that this preface uh, is really important the madkhal is very important because a lot of the time a lot of focus is based upon studying the text but very little time is given with regards to the adab or the etiquette or so the manners of seeking knowledge illa man rahimallah except for whom allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mercy and this is something which needs to be discussed in the west so today i would like to start off with a statement by one of the imams of the people of hadith or the imam of ahlul hadith of his time al imam al shafi'i rahimahullah ta'ala when he defined the conditions or the fundamental conditions in order to obtain knowledge he defined six fundamental conditions ash-shurutul asasiyya i don't know if this was mentioned before but if it was mentioned before for those of you who are present then this will be a recap and refreshing their memory and for those of you who are not present then they will come to know of the six important conditions a beginner 
Mubtadi' with a hamza, not with a ain. Mubtadi' with a ain refers to a heretic. Mubtadi' with a hamza refers to a beginner. So the mubtadi' in or the beginner, when it comes to seeking knowledge, Imam Al Imam Shafi'i, rahimahullah Taala, said that the person who pursues the path of seeking knowledge, al-shurutul asasiya, those fundamental conditions must be adhered to and fulfilled. Only then will that student of knowledge or beginner or seeker of knowledge be able to obtain and attain knowledge. So what are the six that Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah mentioned? He said, أخي لن تنال العلم إلا بستة سأنبيك أن تفصيلها ببيان ذكاء وحرص واجتهاد وبلغة وصحبة أستاذ وطول زمان So Imam Shafi رحمه الله said Brother you will never ever be able to attain knowledge except with six things. I will inform you of these in detail and with clarity. So he said, Dhaka'in, which is intelligence. And then he said, Wahirsin, which is passionate and eagerness, enthusiasm. Then he said, Wajtihadin, which is diligence. And then he said, وَبَلْغَتِن Which is to sacrifice financially and physically. وَصُحْبَةِ أُسْتَادٍ Supervision from a teacher. وَطُولِ زَمَانٍ Considerable amount of time. So these are the six things which Imam Shafi'i رحمه الله تعالى mentioned. And we have covered all six of these, alhamdulillah, in our previous meetings, in the preface, in the madkhal. This line of poetry, which has been ascribed and attributed to Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah ta'ala, can be found in the Divan al-Shafi'i, volume 1, page 113. So ponder and contemplate over these six things. Somebody asked, oh, what is the third one? The third one that was mentioned is Ijtihadin, which is diligence or to sacrifice and to work hard. So I'll mention the six once again because there are students who are asking. The first one is intelligence. A foolish man cannot seek knowledge, which is the Ka'in, as mentioned in the poetry. The second Imam, Imam Shafi rahimullah, said Hirsin, which is passionate, eagerness, enthusiasm. The third is Ijtihad, which is diligence to be somebody who is who strives hard, works hard. Balgatin or Bulgatin, which is sacrifice financially and uh, physically and the fifth is sohbati ustad to be supervised by a sheikh or by a teacher and the sixth is considerable amount of time we recovered this al waqtul kafi al bulgha sacrifice is as the people of knowledge they said al bulgha is ma yakfi li sadd al haja means that something which is sufficient for a person who is seeking knowledge, that which will suffice him, that which will suffice and cover and meet his essential needs. So a talib al a person who starts to seek knowledge, he leaves the comfort of his home, he leaves his comfort zone, he leaves his parents, his siblings, his community, his friends, his loved ones, and if he is married, his 
his wife. And if he has children, then his wife and his children. So he makes this sacrifice. And when he's seeking knowledge, he's not concerned about making a million or becoming a millionaire. He will only focus, if it comes to finances, or if it comes to having some form of stability, that he is able to eat, drink, and, and shelter and clothe himself with the bare essentials. This is what it means by al -Wulf. When it comes to considerable amount of time, so when it comes to the length of time and seeking, and we said this, al waqtul kafi that which was used in one of the four things which I mentioned, was al waqtul kafi Al-Imam al-Shafi'i, rahimahullah, he said, وَطُولِ zamani." Meaning considerable amount of time. So he didn't, a considerable amount of time differs from person to person. So when it comes to the length of time and seeking knowledge, then this is relative to each person individually in a unique manner and in its context. That which is important to consider and take heed of is that the correct methodology of seeking knowledge, not how much time is spent in seeking knowledge. Some people, they say that Tudu Zamani means that you need to spend years. So you find somebody who may spend years in a Darul Uloom and come out as a as ignorant, as a donkey. So it's not just about the Kam. It's about the Kaif as well. So Naam, a considerable amount of knowledge should be taken. We know that this is not like a degree, a four-year degree. And when after you are awarded with a degree, then you became a scholar, a guaranteed scholar, like in physics or mathematics or law or medicine. But like we said, that there is no fixed time for this. But now that which is the norm is that there is no fast track in this. That, that, that every single person climbs the second ladder. That is different for the one who is able to climb the steps a bit faster than the others. That is relative. But that which is, is that a lot of period of time is taken in seeking knowledge. So there are students who learn quickly and there are students who learn late. So there are students who memorize quickly, but understand slowly. There are students who understand quickly and memorize slowly. So this differ differs from students to But that which is the benchmark is that a considerable amount of time must be sacrificed and allocated for seeking knowledge. There's no fast track in seeking knowledge. So... Is that clear so far? Alhamdulillah. So we need to keep this in mind when we seek knowledge. So the the musibah of, of the West or the calamity of the West is that if you look at these ashurutul asasiyah, which were mentioned by Al Imam al Shafi'i, rahimahullah ta'ala, almost over 1200 years ago. And if you just look at these fundamental conditions and apply them to those who you see in the West, in the field of da'wah, or in the arena of da'wah, you will be able to know whether these individuals are in reality qualified to speak about such affairs. And if they have adhered and fulfilled the prerequisites or the conditions and have taken the same path which was taken by the likes of Al-Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah and those who came after him and those who came before him. That's how simple the equation is. It's not complicated. And by this, you'll be able to X off many of your speakers, many of your YouTubers, many of your celebrities, and I don't have to say anymore. So when it comes to sacrifice, I know of a student that is present here today amongst us, that due to this particular student's parents being modernists or having a modernist ideology, he has to secretly leave his house, sit in the car early in the morning. It's really early there. I'm talking about maybe four o'clock, five o'clock in the morning and come to this lesson to seek knowledge. 
I know of a certain individual. So this is when Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah, when he said, Ijtihadi, Abu al And this student is amongst you here. And I know of this student particularly. And I'm pretty sure that there must be other students who are here who are who have to make their sacrifices to come and attend this lesson due to the different time zones, due to the different obligations, due to work, whatever the reasons may be. So that's why I say to those who are in the UK, and Allah has truly blessed you with such blessings that even when the teacher has to give preference to those in the UK because he's from the UK and he resides in the UK. But very soon I'll be returning back, alhamdulillah, back to Medina. So then we will be giving consideration to other time zones. But wallahu al-musta'an. So there are students amongst us here who are fulfilling those conditions mentioned by Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah. Ijtihad here does not mean ijtihad in the terminology of fiqh. Ijtihad here means the literal meaning of ijtihad, which is to strive and work hard and steadfastness when it comes to seeking knowledge. So there's a student amongst you. And this student is very young in age. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve him. That he has to sit in his car secretly leave his house so that his parents don't catch him and so that he can come to this lesson early hours in the morning Allah knows what time it is there now he's, but he's in a different time zone so but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make his path to Jannah easy because the one who seeks knowledge then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make his path to Jannah easy as we know the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa but I mentioned this point here today to make you contemplate and reflect that sitting in front of a laptop and having a cup of coffee and busting out some lyrics and you know quoting a few hadiths and a few references does not make us from the people of knowledge. This does not make you from amongst the people of knowledge. Ijtihad meaning, you know, tiring yourself out. And some of the people of knowledge, they say, one, one, one of our sheikhs, may Allah bless his soul, Shaykhuna uh, Mufti Muhammad Rais Nadwi Rahmatullah once said to me when I was sitting with him, and when we were talking about the importance of seeking knowledge, he said to me, that give everything you have. Ransom everything that you have, your wealth, your health, and your family. Everything that you have in order to seek knowledge for the sake of Allah. Then you will see the fruits of this knowledge either in this dunya or in the hereafter. But if you don't have that aspiration or ambition or intention, then you will get nowhere. So he said to me, you have to sacrifice everything, everything that you have. So I had a watch on at that time, and he pointed at my watch. He said this, if you would have to sell this watch, he says it looks like a good watch. In exchange for knowledge, meaning to buy a book of knowledge, then your mindset and your focus when it comes to seeking knowledge would be that you would not be hesitant and would not be a person who would be of two minds when it came to exchanging this watch for that book of knowledge. So when you reach to that level, and when you really are enthusiastic and passionate about seeking knowledge, that you give everything in runs. Your wealth, your health, and everything that you possess, and even your family. So he said to me, at times it will be so that at night you may need to read and that will upset your family. But your enthusiasm for knowledge will only increase and not decrease. 
your passion for knowledge should increase day by day. The more you read and the more you remove the ignorance within you, the more you want to empower and the more and the more you want to increase your knowledge because knowledge is only one of the few things in the entire Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to ask for it excessively otherwise everything else is in moderation وَقُرْ رَبِّ زِذْنِي إِلْمَا No boundaries when it comes to seeking knowledge So what does sacrifice exactly mean? As one of the companions used to fast all day and pray all night, neglected his wife, and the Prophet ﷺ said, Your wife has a right over you. أَتِي كُلَّ ذِي حَقٍ حَقَّهُ You're talking about the hadith of Salman al-Farsi and Abu Darda. رضي الله عنهما. نعم. So, like I said to you, that sacrifice is also relevant and differs from person to person. Okay? So, at times, when it comes to your own right, meaning the right that you have upon yourself, you sacrifice that. And at times, the right that you have with your family, if you are married and you excuse yourself and your wife excuses you, then you engage and you engross in seeking knowledge. Or if you have parents and your parents allow you to spend all your free time in seeking knowledge. If you were to look at a person who has 24 hours a day, Okay, in those 24 hours a day, we have obligations. We have the five times obligations that we have to answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and pray. Other than that, we have our work, our job. For those of us who work, we have our families. that. When you look at all the obligations, when you pull out that spare time that is left for ourselves, all that time is a must in seeking knowledge. That's where the sacrifice starts. Abdulaziz, do you understand? So if you have that period of time, so your own period of free time, that, that time is your time, then you have a choice between that time. Either to engage in ibadah, as Abu Darda did, or either to engage in seeking knowledge. And we've already mentioned in our previous lessons that at times, seeking knowledge is better and superior than nafil ibadah. Can we remember this? This is why one of the reasons I mentioned this. So that period of time that you have, that time is a must that you exhaust yourself and you're on top of that, that that is all your ijtihad is totally focused. Every single second of that time is focused in seeking knowledge. Then when it comes to your other obligations, then either you have a negotiation with those obligations or you have a brother or a sister like my, myself, for example, I have another brother. So that brother of mine, my younger brother, made that sacrifice to look after my parents. And he still looks after them till this day, when I'm not in the country. And he's taken the burden and the obligation. When I come back to the UK, then we share that obligation. But when I'm not present, he has, my sibling has made it easy for me. And may Allah reward him. And the knowledge that I obtain and I get, he gets a share reward of that. I would not be able to seek that knowledge or it would not be permissible for me to seek that knowledge unless my brother took it upon himself to fulfill that obligations with the consent of my parents. So Talibul Ilm, a Talibul Ilm, he's smart. So those obligations that you have, you have to try to work or whenever you make, when you start with your sacrifice, to, to, to increase seeking your knowledge and make that ijtihad. The other obligations you have, you try to minimize, minimize them by not neglecting them. But at the same time, if you're able to savage any type of free time, then that time is used in seeking knowledge. So for example, you have another sibling who say, will say, okay, you seek knowledge, I'll do this obligation for you. Okay, so or you may have a husband who will say to his wife, you can cook one day and we'll eat for three days or we will eat for two days. And during that time of the cooking that you do, you can go and seek knowledge. So the husband will get the reward and the wife will fulfill the obligation of cooking for her husband and feeding him. But at the same time, she will use that time to seek knowledge. So this differs from person to person. But the talib al-ilm, the, the, the smart student of knowledge is smart. And he's always looking for 
openings or a window where he has the chance of utilizing that time. So a good student of knowledge, like our teachers used to say, is that student of knowledge who has a time planner. And in his 24 hours, he plans of how he is going to seek his knowledge. I know that uh, it's been said with one of the sheikhs, Al-Allama uh, Abdul Jalil Al-Samurudi, rahimahullah ta'ala. The sheikh would always travel in first class on the trains in India. So once, you know, one, one brave student, you know, he might have wanted to ask the sheikh that maybe this is his saraf, maybe this is excessive. The sheikh is always traveling in first class. He would never travel in second class. You know, one of the students asked the sheikh, they said to the sheikh, they said, um, Sheikh, um, why is it that you always travel in first class? Whenever we go to drop you to the station, you're always telling us to find the, find the coach, the first class coach. So the sheikh smiled back and said to him, he said, you know why I travel always in first class? Then he showed his work with him. He goes, when I travel in first class, these three, four hours of journey. So his journey was from his village to Bombay, which is about a five hour journey on the train, four to five hours. He goes, during that four hour and five hour journey, he goes, I'm writing an explanation uh, on hadith, on one of the books of hadith, I review what I have written. So I utilize that time. So this is the smart stone of knowledge. So there was another sheikh uh, that they say in the olden days. And you know, in the olden days, they used to write with, you know, those pens that you get in the ink pots. What do you call those pens that are made out of bamboo? There's, I think there's a special name for them. But you know, the, you know, those pens that are, um, those, what do you call them? The ones that you put in the you dip into the ink pots, the quill now, fountain pens, or you know, the olden days. There wasn't pens, there weren't pens at that time, but they were made of like bamboo sticks. I've seen them. So there was a sheikh that he would have a time where he would accept guests. You know, they would come to see him. And while the guests used to see him, he used to have a knife and he used to, what do you call it? Um, peel or sharpen and make those pens. So students saw him that always when he has guests, he's always doing this. So they asked him, Chef, why do you always do this when you have guests? He says, so I don't have to allocate special time to skin those, you know, these bamboo sticks that you have to make them pens out of. So I do two things, multitask. So a still of knowledge, one of the key success of a student of knowledge is that he should master multi he should be somebody who is skillful and is able to do multitasks efficiently so he's always looking at times of doing two things at once three things at once if he's able to do so so his time when it comes to talab al-ilm is utilized maximized when it comes to seeking knowledge and everybody's timetables differ with their obligations, with their responsibilities, etc. When Umar ibn Khattab used to work one day and seek knowledge one day. So that, that's how it worked for him. We've all read about this, can we remember? So someone in America will be different from someone in the UK, somebody in Nigeria will be different from somebody in India. But this is how we need to. Uh, you know, seek, uh, seek knowledge. I know somebody, uh, a friend of mine, and uh, when we met this friend, he was nothing really. He was an Arab. He wasn't Salafi or... So at that time, you're talking in the 90s, we bought him uh, 200, 300 cassettes of Sheikh Al-Bani. So what would happen is that when I would go to stay with him, we'd sleep in the same room, uh, he would put a cassette on for 45 minutes and everybody would fall asleep <laughs> listening to Sheikh Al-Bani. At the end of when he finished all 300 cassettes, he had become Salafi and also he knew the positions of Sheikh Al-Bani Allah because we would ask him. He said, yes, I heard this and Sheikh Al-Bani said this is his position. Yes, I heard this. So see, so a woman who is cooking for her husband 
and with modern technology. And this is another blessing that you have. وَأَمَّا بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ فَحَدِّثْ As Allah says in the Quran. Another, another tool that we have in our time is modern technology. So multitask. And multitask is not always favorable. It's, it's okay to a certain extent. Because you don't want to end up doing something to go to such extremes that you do two things, but you don't do any of them precisely. If you're that, that type of a clumsy person, then multitask is not for you. Then you pray to Allah that Allah blesses you in your time. For for those who are able to, at times, can be able to do certain things which are multitasked. Do you understand? So I don't want you to think that I encourage everybody, not everybody is able to do multitasks in certain jobs. In certain things, you're able to do so. So, so I know somebody recently um, told me that they have a job. And their job is basically to go to these patients, sick patients who are at the end of their life. Basically, they're dying. And they have to go do night duty and stay there. So they can't sleep. So they can watch TV and do it, but they can't sleep. They have to sit. So I said to this person, and I recommend it, I said, why don't you start reading the seed of the Prophet and start reading the books of knowledge. Uh -huh. So this person now, when he goes to work at night, is benefiting by multitasking, is looking after the patient in front of his eyes. And all night he's seeking knowledge, and reading stuff, and researching, and writing, and reading Qur'an. So I said, divide your time in reading Qur'an, reading Hadith, and seeking knowledge. And then take a break. So this person, he told me that he balances it. So he's got a bit of a business that he wants to do. So he'll do some reading. Then he'll go back to his business. And then he'll go back to reading. And, and that's how the whole night comes. But Alhamdulillah, he's been reading. So he's read a few books now, Alhamdulillah. But before, he, had, he used to do nothing when he comes to Talab al So this is now multitasker. He's doing two jobs at once. He's sitting there looking after this patient that is dying. And that patient might need in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom or might need to give the medicine or do something. But at the same time, he's seeking knowledge. So that's why I say that uh, sometimes a multitask may be beneficial for some and not beneficial for some. There are certain jobs we can't do multitasks. So in that case, we have to look for openings or a window. So we have to reshuffle our schedule. We always, but the Talib ilm is always looking for those openings. He never ever sits idle. And he never ever wastes time. So the time is like a sword. If you do not cut it, it will cut you. Always remember that. Al-waqtuka safe. The time is like a sword. If you don't cut it, it will cut you. So is that clear with regards to Imam Shafi'i? Uh, and what was mentioned. I hope uh, these points were uh, these 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 pointers uh, yeah, have been beneficial in what I have mentioned with regards to the experience of others on 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 helping you how to seek knowledge. You know, these six fundamental conditions should be a criteria for you. To see with regards to those who claim themselves to be from pe the people of knowledge. Does the criteria of what Al Imam Shafi'i Rahimullah mentioned, do you see these the, the tick list being ticked off for these for these people? If you don't, then you, you shouldn't you shouldn't even be wasting your time listening to such people. You don't, you don't need to go any further. Now with regards to we talked about in our previous meeting the importance that knowledge mandates action. Yes, we know we know that knowledge mandates action. That the thamratul ilm, the fruit of seeking knowledge, is to implement that knowledge. So wherever we find in the Quran that first knowledge precedes action, illa amanu wa amilu salihat. That um, that that iman always precedes action, amalu salihat, and this is the 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 sequence. That knowledge precedes action. Having knowledge, which is Iman, precedes and comes before acting upon knowledge. You can't act upon knowledge and then seek knowledge. That logically doesn't make sense. But knowledge mandates and obligates acting upon it. 
offer. So there are some books that the people of knowledge have 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 recommended that uh, you know we need to refer to uh, when it comes to knowledge and actions. One of the books was mentioned already previously, uh, which is Iqtida'ul Ilm Amali of Al Khatib Al Baghdadi. Knowledge mandates actions, and there is the English. PDF available. Like I said, one day we need to read through this with beneficial notes of Sheikh Al Bani, Rahimahullah Taala. The second book is Dhammu Man La Yamal Bi Ilmihi of Hafid Ibn Asakir. The dispraise upon the one who does not act upon his knowledge of Ibn Asakir. And Ibn Abdul Bar, the Spanian, he has a whole chapter with regards to the one who does not act upon his knowledge, the one who is dispraised. And, and, and that's a book we will find a chapter in Jami'u Bayan al Ilmi Fa Fadli. So Dhammu Man La Ya'mal Bi Ilmi. And then Jami'u Jami'u Bayan al Ilmi Wa Fadli. Then you have Al Imam Al Ajuri, he has a book called Akhlaq Al Ulama. And then you have Ibn al Qayyim. He has a book called Miftahu Dari Saada. So, and then you have Ibn Rajab al Hanbali. He has a book called Fadl Ilm al Salafi ala Ilm al Khalaf. So, these books that have been mentioned Ibn Abdul Bards and Imam al Ajuris and Ibn al Qayyims and Ibn Rajab al Hanbalis, then these books all have a chapter or all have a section which talks about. The dangers of of having knowledge and not acting upon it. Now, so these are some of the books that we which we can refer to. So I mentioned the book of Ibn Asakir, Dhammu Man La Ya'mal Bi Aya Bi Ilmi, and then Jami U Bayan Al Ilmi Wa Fadli of Ibn Abdul Bar. Then we have Miftahu Dar Saada of Ibn Qayyim, Rahimullah Ta'ala. We have Akhlaq al Ulama of Al Imam Al Ajuri. He has a whole section in there talking about uh, the, the dangers or dispraising the one who has knowledge and does not act upon it. So that's why you will find today those who memorize Al Usul al Thalatha and those who understand Al Usul al Thalatha. But when it comes to the practicality, of the book of Al-Usul Al-Thalatha, then you will find very few implementing it. So you'll see somebody who teaches Al-Usul Al-Thalatha or learns it, then he will be sharing his platform and sitting with those who teach the books of the Asha'ir. And this shows that this is Dham Man La Ya'mal Bi Ilmi. As Ibn Asakir said, but this is something to be dis. This is a dis. This is disparagement or dispraise. So the real ilm is the one who is able to implement that ilm, not theoretically just knowing it. And this is the problem that we have today in our times, that we need to implement our ilm. So it's not good knowing the uh, the dalil for this and the dalil for that, and this this and that, and not being able to implement it. Where we have to make bara. From the people of shirk and their shirk and the people of bida and their bida, one of the way of making bara is not to share platforms with them, or to promote them, or to venerate them, or to support their dawah. Which you find many are not able to do so. Illa marhamallah. So that's where you find the discrepancy and the inconsistency. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from this type of hypocrisy. That that knowledge, which is of no benefit and is not acted upon, becomes a hujjah against us and not for us. Otherwise, theoretically, al-usul al-thalatha, even John and James and Samantha and Fiona, if they are studying 
a master's course at the one of the universities, Western universities in the department of Orientalism, can master al-usul al and, and and pass it. Or the most important thing is with regards to al-usul al is to implement it in our lives. On our day-to-day -to -day lives. So when it comes to the people of shirk, when it comes to the people of bidah, our positions are clear with regards to such people. And those who support them and aid them are the people of deviancy. Because when we study the text of Al-Usul al we will see that these are, these are the things which are fundamentally mentioned in Al-Usul al Just not understanding what I'm saying. So it's not just the theoretical side of things of just memorizing Al-Usul al and knowing its evidences and knowing what's right and what's wrong, but it's implementing it in your life. That's the purpose or the objective of studying Al-Usul al not to memorize the text. Like I said to you, John, James, Fiona, and Samantha can also memorize al usul al And I know people who have memorized texts, classical texts, and they're not even Muslims. I've seen people who have, I was sitting in the British Museum Library, and I saw that the book al iqlil of Al-Hakim was transcribed by an orientalist and I was told that he had memorized most of this text there you go that he read the manuscript so many times that he had almost memorized it uses that text to him today in Ulum al-Hadith he gave so much time to that text that that text is, it became part of his you know bloodstream so, ikhwa, ikhwati wa akhwati, my brothers and sisters, the purpose of me teaching you al-usul al-thalatha is to implement it in your lives. That's why a great focus has been said with regards to knowledge mandates action. Otherwise, theoretically, and memorizing the text, and 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 and, and publicizing it, and, and and making it public, and and putting it on Instagram, anybody can do this. Yeah. Anybody can do this. Nothing to be mesmerized about. If you can't understand and comprehend and apply it, tatbiq al ilm amal is very important. The implementation of the knowledge that you have is very important. <laughs> Naam. Are we clear so far? Tayyip. So, we've gone through. Now we're going to talk about the another issue, which is of, of quite importance. And this is known as Ma'alim al-Ulum. So, Ma'alim al-Ulum. What do I mean by ma'alim al What I mean about ma'alim al are the milestones and landmarks of knowledge. <coughs> Alhamdulillah. So the milestones and landmarks of knowledge. So this is another issue that's going to be discussed here. So every single subject and that you study. There are three important milestones or landmarks that you must obtain and pass. Do you understand? This is very important. Ma'alimul ilm. Do you understand? Ma'alimul ilm. So what did I say? Milestones and landmarks of knowledge. So we have different subjects that we study. So for example, we have Ilm al-Aqeedah, which we are studying. Then you have Ilm al-Hadith. Then you have Ilm al-Tafsir. Then you have Ilm al-Usul. Then you have Ilm al-Fiqh. Then you have Ilm al All the different subjects that we study. You know that there are many subjects when it comes to Al-Ulum al-Shari'ah. And we've, and we've discussed all of these in our previous meetings, if you were to go back to our 15 meetings and were to revise and listen to the things which I have transmitted to you 
on the authority of the people of knowledge, you would be able to derive hundreds of benefits. But the problem is that you students take the knowledge, but you don't want to pass it on to others and work with benefits and share it amongst your brothers and sisters. You don't attend these lessons so that you can inspire them to come and uh, benefit from these lessons as well as benefit from the benefits. You don't know that a single benefit of yours could be the means of somebody being guided to seeking knowledge. And just imagine they start to seek knowledge through your help and aid and assistance. You're sorted on the day of on, on your Qiyam. So why, why, why do you want to be like a miser? So you need to work hard and to share your knowledge. Sharing is caring, like they say. Ma'alim is the mufrad of ma'alim. Ma'alim. It's like a landmark or a milestone. Ma'alim is the principle of ilm. Ilm is singular and ulum is, is the plural. The clear Abu Nur al Maghrabi, Allah. So, the people of knowledge, they say, whatever subject that you are studying, there are three milestones or landmarks which are very important. Al Ma'lam al Awwalu, the first milestone or landmark of any subject that you study is with regards to the ma'alim, ma'alim al-uloom, then people of knowledge have said three are very important. Okay. The first ma'alim are the, the different doors or sections of that particular subject. So we have abwab, so we have the different, so you study, for example, Ilm al In Ilm al you have Ilm al In Ilm al you have Rububiyya, Uluhiyya, Asma wa Sifat. So these are all the different sections. And then under each door, you have the different Masai. So you need to study all the Abwaab, all the different sections of that particular subject and all the Masai relating to that particular topic. So you have the subject, under the subject you have the topics, and under the topics you have all the Masai. So you have a, a main subject, okay, you have a main subject, al -ilm al -aqil. then you have a sub-subject which is like a door, and within the sub-subject you have topics, and all these topics have different, different issues. So you need to, to study these different subjects and this ma'lam or this milestone and landmark has kutub manhajiya mutadarraja so it has allocated books which a student of knowledge studies in stages is that clear so we have a core subject Within that core subject, we have abwab, then we have another, maybe another subject, and then that subject has topics. And then those topics have Masai. So when this all is, everything is put together, the abwab, the Masai, and then the kutubu manhajiyya mutadarrija, the, the allocated books for all those different Masai. So for example, Asma wa Sifat, for example, the refutation on the Ash'ara, for example, the refutation on the Jahmiya, for example, the, the doubts of the Quburiyun, the grave worshippers. We will stop here so we can go pray Maghrib. Jazakumullah khair. I hope the lesson has been beneficial today with regards to the Ma'alim. So we've covered al ma'lam al awwalu al wal ma'lam al thani and wal ma'lam al thalith These three Ma'alim and the six conditions of Ash-Shurut al asasiyah and the three ma'alim should always be in the back of your mind when you study any subject with any teacher. Jazakumullah khairah wa barakallahu feekum wa nafa'a bikum al-Islam al-Muslimin. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.